architecture, it, you know, it is really um, the design thread that runs right through a project. Episode 134. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking to Martin King, who is an architect and the practice leader of Douglas and King Architects. Now, Douglas and King grew up in Shoreditch in East London in a time before it was the uber trendy design fashion capital location of East London. And they were actually one of the architects that were responsible to contributing to a lot of the locale's growth. Now, many of Douglas and King's early clients were not sophisticated developers um, that were buying up land in Shoreditch, but actually they were lay people and landowners of underdeveloped properties and semi-derelict warehouses. And this created a unique opportunity for the practice and helped them develop their design agendas and their expertise and how they could best be serving these lay developers if you like and very much put the architect in the driving seat at the front of the project. Currently nowadays uh, they work with more large housing developers, uh, more sophisticated clients, large city owners and they maintain that client base of lay landowners and private sector developers. So in this conversation Martin and I discuss the evolution of Douglas and King Architects we talk about what Martin calls the orange thread, which is the architect's involvement from start to finish of a project. And Martin also discusses how to align high quality design work with the business agendas of our clients. So sit back, relax and enjoy Martin King. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Martin, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to be here in this fabulous studio space that we've got underneath your offices, uh, which are upstairs. You said you've been here since 2002? That's right. I I started working in Shoreditch in 98, actually, in in Paul Street, uh, uh, around there. But 2002, we were actually established within this uh, group of buildings here on Curtin Road. So yeah, 2002. Brilliant. And how did you, how did, how did the practice start? Well, um, it, actually, it was a, a collaboration between myself and my good friend, Craig Douglas. Um, so that's where the names come from, Douglas yeah. and King. And uh, we, we based ourselves in Shoreditch, obviously, as we've just said, in 2002. And what was really interesting about Shoreditch at that time was that it was a, sort of a, a, an urban backwater, really, right on the northern fringe of the city of London. And it was semi-derelict, really. Mm. And it had been, um, it was, um, it had this incredible building stock dotted around uh, within the conservation area, very important conservation area. But it's post-industrial landscape, which means that they were, the building stock was incredible. Um, and there was vacant sites, buildings that were underutilized and semi-derelict. Uh, it was a real, um, a, you know, a fertile ground for development. Um, and what happened was, uh, along with ourselves as architects, a lot of creatively led uh, businesses moved into the area. Um, and there was a lot of uh, uh, government um, uh, and local government led um, incentives uh, to try to regenerate this, this part of town. But, um, and they've been hugely successful. But I think what's really interesting is, is for an architect, it was such a great um, uh, place to have actually moved into. Yeah. Because we, we were immersed in this huge regeneration program. And it was a regeneration program with a great building stock, but also with great clients. Great clients because they were not really professional developers, but landowners right. and lay okay. people who had very little um, concept of, you know, of, of how to deliver a very big project. So obviously, as an architect, you're getting involved in a project and you have to uh, start from the very beginning and explain the entire process mm. and lead from the front. So um, we worked for, yeah, uh, uh, in fact, our own landlord here. Um, we worked for many numerous uh, landowners um, uh, in, 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 uh, in Shoreditch and Dalston and its environs. 
Um, but yeah, it was our responsibility to uh, form the business model for a development, to actually identify what the development could be and how it how it would, could be successful. For right, so you you actually going out and looking and finding the yeah exactly. Sites it was it was all about local knowledge, really. I mean, as an architect, we have our, our sort of uh, urban knowledge because we, we're members of all sorts of really cool organisations that really sort of are the forefront of uh, you know uh, uh, thinking on how to. Uh, develop your city well but we were right in the middle of Shoreditch so we, we we had a lot of local knowledge and we got to know agents and businessmen and uh, you know the various landowners particularly uh, landlords um, and we got to know the council very well um, not just Hackney but the, 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 obviously there's Camden, Islington it's a, it, there's a lot of other councils uh, that, that are, are, are part of this but there was the New Deal Communities Programme, which yeah. was a sort of a 90s policy um, to regenerate it. Um, but yeah, you'd walk around in the, in, you know, the late 90s, early uh, 2000 in Shoreditch, and it was just a, it was, it was really weird space. It was very sort of East London-y and very, um, uh, there was very few people about. Um, not like it is today. Not like it is today. It's, it, the regeneration boom has been huge. And in fact, I read that in 2014, five times more businesses moved to Shoreditch than moved to Canary Wharf. And really? that's a sign of the sort of attraction, um, you know, the success of this, this the regeneration program. Yeah. But it, it, it involves so many different components. There's mm. the, um, the 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 uh, the actual building stock was ideal for it. It's got a unique unique spirit where um, it, it's got a historical kind of precedent that stretches actually all the way back to Shakespeare. And then you had the industrial revolution, and then the post-industrial, post-war mm. um, sort of decline. Um, and it just left us with this 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 huge bu this building stock. And and what's been encouraged around here is is sort of uh, working with the old and the new. So that a lot of the regen a lot of the projects have been putting very contemporary extensions and very contemporary new buildings in amongst all of this kind of very dense fabric, very dense yeah. uh, urban grain. Um, but yeah, that's incredible training ground for. Um, and has it in the early days of the of the of Douglas and King was it were you doing a lot of private residential work or was it mainly these development types of projects um, or yeah well a lot of it is ad adapting existing buildings and actually right. in Shoreditch you know it, it was uh, there's a lot of very cool apartments and you know a lot of very uh, apartment buildings we have a, the, a residential need but we also have a commercial need we're right on the edge of the city so we yes. were we were and then you have the the, the sort of um, what I call the outlier projects so um, you do your residential building or you're a conversion of a warehouse into an, a, a really cool office building with roof extensions and all the bits at the back um, but then, then you have the outliers like that we, we we are architects for the strong room bar and several other uh, you know, know fit out bar, bars yeah. yeah it's a great bar um really lovely people. super cool upstairs yeah it's owned by um uh, air studios right okay. have, uh, and they're but they, they've been here since the 80s, actually, and they used to have raves in their space. And they, they asked us to, um, you know, fit out their space. And we, we'd done some conversion work in, 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 in the other buildings. Um, and the MD there, you know, we did a great, it's a lovely bar, actually. It's a great place to go. And we did the fit out on that. Um, but there's all sorts of restaurants and things that you get involved in as well. So it's, a, it's a quite a broad spectrum of different projects that are actually um, introduced to you, not really by their typology, but by the culture of Shoreditch and the, um, uh, and the building fabric that you're presented with and the dereliction, actually, and the regeneration. Yeah. But, um, we, we, but, were, um, we, were, we were talking earlier um, about confidence. Yes. And I thought this was a really nice way to kind of introduce a bit about how your practice works hmm. and you know for you what does what does it mean what do you mean by when you say uh, you know as an industry yes confidence is one of the most sort of important aspects of what it is that we do it's interesting um well i, I have to say in, in my own experience um certainly uh, it, it amongst younger architects there does seem to be a confidence issue and i think that, that you know um there are many other professions in, in our industry and, uh, you know, architecture, it, you know, is it, really um, the, sort of the, the, the design thread that runs right through a project and from start to finish. And it's critically important that, 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 that we have the confidence to deliver our projects. Mm. Um, I think it's very interesting that architecture schools really focus on design and they, they quite rightly, actually, you know, all of the various uh, components that, that, that make a great and successful development and a great successful building. But what they don't, you know, um, focus on so much is actually how to deliver those, those projects. And that's something that you get through professional practice. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I think that for Douglas and King particularly, you know, working in Shoreditch has has built so much confidence in, in us in, yeah. in, in about how we, we have to lead from the front of a project. And we make sure that, uh, you know, we, we have developed processes and designed processes, I think is the key word here, 
that, that, that will allow our projects to, 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 to survive you know, throughout the, the delivery process through planning and tendering and construction, um, you know, all with the core values intact. So yeah. that, you know, the, the, the benefit is, 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 you know, the benefit is to our client because they've got a very sound business model for their development. The benefit to the people of Shoreditch or the people of, of, of wherever you're building uh, because, you know, you're creating great buildings that are very focused on how, how it will affect people's lives and how it will be successful for them. Mm. And also, obviously, there's the, the sort of the, the aesthetic side of things, which is, you know, the, 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 how, the evolution of the street and how, yeah. how, uh, our, how we manage to um, sort of uh, make sure that, that we deliver great projects in terms of uh, you know, the construction side of things and make sure that our, our designs are implemented. And, and, and how, how you mentioned there about the, you know, understanding the business model of the client. Mm. How important is it as architects that we understand the business case, and how do yeah. you, and how do you align yourself with the business agenda of yeah. your client whilst maintaining your design aspirations yeah. and wanting to do, you know, I think great that, work. Well, it's certainly, it's a, it's a system that we evolved in Shoreditch that we implement for our much larger clients today, and it's something that's upscaled very well. Um, and what we do at the beginning of a project is we do a design, uh, uh, well, I call it a development pr appraisal, but it's really a business model. Right. And traditionally, it, it, you know, or often people think that the, that the development appraisal is looking at the site constraints, looking at the planning policy, deciding how much volume you can get on the site and how it will react to its immediate neighbours and those sort of design issues. But the truth is, you, you, you need to really plan um, for success, actually, and that, that planning for success is actually how you're going to deliver what it is that you're, you envision, envisage there. And well, we prepare um, a, a development appraisal business model, yeah, um, and that looks at things like the the financial. It makes a financial assessment actually based on you know the cost of delivery. Um, consultants and all the various reports you're going to need along the way. It looks at the construction cost. It looks at uh, the, the taxes that you're going to pay, the, the community infrastructure levies that are likely and the local Section 106 taxes for all types of development. And you put this into a really credible and sound model. Um, so that's one aspect of the development appraisal. The other is that we produce um, a timeline right. that looks at the entire project based on the um, RIBA plan of work. Right. Um, and what that timeline does is it looks, it helps us to explain to, um, to our clients and to our own office and to the various consultants along the way who's going to be involved, what what they um, uh, you know are going to be doing and when, so that we can manage um, relationships within the team. Um, I think, and, and the third part of it is really a critical path analysis. It's about managing risk. Um, which is all really about, you know, there's a lot of kickbacks and a lot of knocks on the way in the development of a project, but you have to plan for those. You have to be uh, proactive in the way that you plan out your project. So what we then end up with is, is a, a, a very uh, aspirational design for a project with a very uh, credible delivery process for every stage. So, but the, I think the most important thing is that, that we as architects with our creative minds are very good at designing those things, mm. not just designing the buildings and you know, how they function and how they're going to work. Um, so, you know, we've, we've delivered, well, in, I think it, we've delivered numerous projects in Shoreditch, but it, this is something that's upscaled throughout the city and, and bigger developers are very attracted to the, the actual model that we've produced yeah. to uh, deliver our projects. And, so. and is it something then that, that you often find developers coming to you with a site that they've got in mind and then you do an appraisal process on that or is it something where you can be much more proactive yeah. where you, you, know, you were saying local knowledge is really key yeah. where you can actually find a site and yeah. run your own appraisal well, that's absolutely right. I mean, as, uh, we, we have a lot of market knowledge. I mean, it, it, we, we started off in East London, obviously, um, and we got to know the local agents and the local business communities. Yeah. But today, uh, you know, we, that's a sort of a, a national thing, actually. Uh, and we know, um, we've got to know um, agents who are bringing us sites from all over the place. But yes, I, we still look at sites ourselves. So there's prime sites all over uh, the United Kingdom, and we have to uh, answer a housing crisis. In fact, I think architects are better at identifying uh, sites than anyone else because we we actually vision we have you know we have a vision not just um you know what what is going to maximize the development potential in terms of volume but what is the best use for that particular site yeah what, you know we, we have a very holistic view and we understand what the planners want you to put on the site what the, what the client wants you to put on the site but what is actually the site telling you the site wants as well mm. you know and the evolution of that 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 particular part of 
wherever it is, I do, you know, generally in London for us, but you know, it, 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 we look at projects all over England and we apply the same principles. Yeah. But yeah, we are, some of our, we've done some great projects, one, you know, a very large project near here, which was 35, it's 35 million construction costs. I hate financial metrics like that, but it's, you know, it just gives you um, some idea of scale. But that was, you know, I, I, I was asked by the local agent, uh, you know, to introduce to the owner of the site, um, a, a friend of mine now, actually, uh, Nigel, and we, um, he asked me if I would do a roof extension on one of the buildings on one of his plots, and he owned a huge swathe of Shoreditch, and I spent, uh, you know, I, I was scratching my head thinking, this is madness, I can't just put a roof extension on that, and I spent the money he gave me on a feasibility study to redevelop the entire site um, with, uh, it was a really interesting pro project actually, and what that involved was knocking down an, a sort of mid-century uh, building that had been built right in the middle of a street through the site, and uh, you know reconfiguring some of the other buildings on the plot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the point is that uh, yeah, that was through direct contact with Nigel. It, he, he enjoyed the feasibility so much. He he asked me to set set in motion a program to deliver the project. In fact, it was granted planning permission. It's um, fifty thousand square feet and right next to Shoreditch Roundabout. Um, just just last year. And he's now talking with talking to various contractors about delivery of the project. But the really interesting thing is the core values and the thread that we introduced in our feasibility study at the very beginning that evolved the business plan is still exists today. Mm. You know, and it survived all of the various planning processes, our agreement and planning um, uh, the planning negotiations through a planning agreement with Hackney. Um, it survived, you know, all of the pricing and, uh, you know, all of the various consultants who've got involved, who've managed to get involved, who've bought into the vision that we created. Yeah. Um, and to deliver a client, you know, a profit for Nigel, for, to deliver really aspirational buildings for the people of Shoreditch who are going to live and work and experience in them. And it'd be a great addition to the conservation area. Okay. What, what, what do you think are the key components to facilitating these types of uh, projects or having that kind of success or having the client buy into what it is that you're proposing? Um, well, I, I, the, 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 the development industry's got a lot of people in, involved in it, you know, and a, a lot of people involved in your own teams, mm. you know, the, the wider peloton, the, the various engineers that need to be in the various report. And what we need to do is, is, is to actually try to simplify the whole process so that we are, um, uh, we as architects uh, create a vision. And what we want to do is to try to get, to work with like-minded people uh, who actually will really buy into that vision. Um, it, for me, it's a bit like, you know, the way that I run the Douglas and King upstairs here is, 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 is you know, you, you do all the lessons about what's being a good boss and what isn't. And what you want to do is not just give someone a good job description and say, look, I want you to build two houses here and make them modern and, you know, off you go. Um, what you're trying to do is try to get them to buy into a, 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 a a very um, sort of aspirational view on how that development will go. Right. So that, you know, you're, you're sort of managing them um, in a way that is very different to a sort of process-led management. It's actually getting buying into a, a, a goal that will be really successful for the project. That way, you know, these people will work endlessly and tirelessly for, uh, 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 for a great result yeah. for your client and for you and for, for the people of, uh, that they're, they're, they're actually building for. Mm. Um, and we apply that to the wider peloton of people we work with. Right. Uh, we, so we try to get our clients to buy into the vision, and we work with very like-minded consultants uh, who understand the importance of a design-led project. Um, that's an odd word, lead, but I'll come back onto that. But it, I think that what we're trying to do is, is, is we want to work with um, you know, affordable housing consultants who, who understand that the, the, the viability is really important to us. We have to be able to do, do this and also deliver a profit to the investors. Yeah. You know, we have to get engineers on board who will be very uh, inventive in the way that we deal with site constraints. We need them to understand what it is the vision that we're trying to create, what type of environments we're trying to create, so that the ultimate goal is always these people are only involved in the project for bits of it, you know, but we, we want them to buy into the entire process. Yes. And I will say that probably the most important relationship, you know, for, in, in the way that we work is we, we need to get, buy and get contractors, once we've got planning, to buy into our vision and build a really great relationship. And I've got, I, 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 that's the one trick I've learned is be a friend of the contractor. 
you know, if you can get them to understand everything from the very detailed design that you're trying to create to the actual concept of the entire building, it's going to go really well for you. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what type of contract you use because, if, you know, with the DMB contract, provided, you know, if, you, if, you are, if your goals are set well and you've written a really good, you know, um, uh, uh, specification of what you're trying to achieve and even produce drawings, you know, that's what the client, the contractor is going to be aiming to achieve. Um, so how, how do you qualify who to work with then when you're building a team in terms of both a developer client mm. and other consultants and a contractor? Um, in terms of what, sorry, I, I, it, it, how, do I, Qu- how do we build our own group? Yeah, how, how, do you, how, like, how do you know when, you know, actually this is not going to be the right relationship yeah. for us or, or, or when do you say no to a project? To be honest, um, it, Again, like with staff, you work really hard on people to sort of to, to, to make sure that they do buy. Most people will buy into it, actually. And most engineers are at or particularly, you know, most consultants love the fact that you've got a passion about you and the yeah. fact that the project is more important than, than, than your own office, more important than, um, you know, the success of the project is the ultimate goal here. And it, uh, the reason it's a design led agenda is, is, is for that. But we, we've built, you know, we're members of, um, you know, the NLA and we're members of, uh, you know, you, you do tend to sort of immerse yourself in this kind of culture of, uh, of, of excellence in construction and well, in development, I mean. Um, and you get to meet people through that. But we've, we've built a very close peloton of uh, different people mm. that we like to work with. And also, it, the funny thing about the out, outcome of it is you, get, you, you become very attractive to the right type of developer. You know, I had a, a developer come to me yesterday. He wants to build, you know, he's got some really interesting sites. And he said, you know, if you, if you design a load of lolly boxes, I'm going to get really upset with you. Yeah. You know, um, but I, I've got to, you know, you've got to bring it in on budget. And I don't mind Tim Framework off-site construction. But I, I thought, Mike, I walked away thinking that's really interesting. He, he's really bought into what, what I've written on my website. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but, um, and he, he's understanding the culture of exactly, of, of, and he of what understands you're the benefit that he'll get a profit out of the job, and he'll, you know, his development company are going to end up with an amazing product that, 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 that and, a, and a very successful community. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, you're talking about like aligning your agenda, your design agendas, with the financial cases or yeah. you know, business models of your, mm. of your clients. Have you ever? gone into development yourself or have been yeah. like actually you know what this is this is something that we could do for ourselves and yeah we could we could be taking a different you know rather than it's a common often question I, I think that as an architect we're, we're we're a guide really you know through the process I, I I don't like this sort of dictatorial leadership thing um am I a developer no I, I I'm an architect there's a subtle difference actually and it's really important that you you sort of uh, you focus on what you're good at and, yes uh, you know um you know, I've evolved my entire career, 35 years now, I mean, yeah, uh, as an architect. And that, uh, yes, you do get involved in developments from time to time. But, um, you know, I think that um, we're much better at helping other people you know, <laughs> to realise their dreams than we are, uh, you know, uh, 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 running developments ourselves. It's incredibly stressful. Yeah. But um, well, what's the main difference, do you think, between the role of developer and the role of the architect? And, um, and, w- and what is it as the architect that we can really bring to developers to empower yeah. them in making good design choices and delivering great projects. Yeah, I mean, it's really important that we try to get people involved in our culture, actually, our wider culture, the culture of the debate in architecture, really. You know, So we'll take our clients and our sort of consultant teams, uh, uh, partners, to, you know, interviews, uh, 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 like the Barbican lectures or to the, uh, the events at the Royal Academy. There's a huge... And there's all sorts of magazines and books that are published about what is excellent. And, you know, we show them presidents of other architects. You know, I took one of my clients to the Barbican lecture recently at McCrane and Lavington, done a great residential, dense residential project on St George's Circus. Um, and, uh, you know... It, it, Slowly and surely, they, they sort of buy into... A lot of people actually are quite well informed because they actually are immersed. You know, a lot of clients are quite interested in architecture. They want... They, they, it, it relieves them of their prejudice, the, the information mm. that you provide them. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it's no fault of theirs because they're fed yes. prejudice. Through you, you, you were saying as well, like, part of the kind of culture that you have um, here is that, like, everything is designed... Yes. What are the sorts of things that you design that a lot of architects might not normally design? Well, I, I have to say, I, 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 I've got a great friend, Max Farrell, and he's been working with me some time now. We, we've got this, uh, we, we believe, 
you know, to, to deliver a very successful project, it's not just an aesthetic response. Mm. You know, it's not just about how, how buildings circulate. There's a huge number of issues that all need to be sorted out and designed. And they are things like the timeline of the project needs to be designed and it needs to be designed creatively. It's not just a process thing. It needs to be designed someone who, by someone who understands the, the entire process, who that, that they can knit that in. Um, there is the financial model needs to be designed. The relationships, actually, I, 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 relationships keep coming up when I discuss this yes. because it's the, probably the most important thing is how people work together is, is, is fundamental to the success of a project. Mm. We want people to, uh, to work for the success of the project, not for the success of their own component of the project. Um, so that all has to be designed. Briefs for the various individuals need to be designed. Um, you know, it's true that there are other sort of disciplines who might be able to facilitate that. But actually, I think that the creative spirit and the holistic view of the scheme it, yes. it puts us in the, in the driving seat as being very good at that. But anyway, you don't do it alone. When you design these, these little components of, of, of the, the, uh, uh, the process, um, you, 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 you t as we said, we, you work with like-minded people who are conscious surveyors and uh, you know who help you with the financial aspects of it. You work with you know, people who are excellent at understanding uh, sustainability. You mm. know, and we've got some great consultants, such exciting uh, things coming up with what we're about to do in terms of uh, re reducing our carbon footprint to zero. Anyway, um, uh, 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 we work with planning consultants who understand you know and help us to explain to the council you know why our ideas might be slightly different. Yeah. theirs and why they will be very successful um, that needs to be designed that whole approach needs to be designed but it's yeah. not done alone you know it is it, a relationship thing and so when you write a brief you say I want you to help me do this mm. uh, you don't say it, you're going to it sounds like it's much more of a collaborative approach as opposed to yeah. like, it's like you say not this dictatorial leadership that's where right yeah. you're taking charge and yeah it's it's you know you want you want um, the people you work with to consider you as a friend, really, I think you know it, it, it's it's the collaboration thing and the, the leader thing is all it's all very sort of talked about a lot, but it's a bit overused. I think you know what makes a successful um, uh, uh, project is a sort of an aspirational group of people who are all focused on a common goal. Mm. Ultimately, it's got you know, um, and and you sort of you have to introduce structures to that, and you you different companies work in different ways, and you, you have to alter your your um, your model in order to, to facilitate that, and yes. they work in different ways for different reasons. You know, everything, you know, uh, every site, every every thing you're trying to do, it's got variations to it. Yeah, but the, you know, the core the core thing is the thread that runs through it is mm. is, is, is the actual um, the very conceptual design stage that you start with. And how um, and how do you maintain that thread, like once you've done delivered the project, do you still have like a yeah. kind of relationship? with your projects yeah. once they've kind of come alive, if you like? Well, there's a number of re things you do. I mean, the, the, the development appraisal business model needs to be tracked throughout the project. And we right. do a, a, so, it, various projects. Uh, we tend to, we maintain our business model all the way through, but it gets really more credible as you go along, as you get quantity surveyors involved and they tell you what the truth is about the, the fiscal situation. Right, so that actual appraisal process that you've done at the beginning yeah, is kind of... It's tracked. Is yeah. tracked and you've got kind of... What, what are the sorts of things that you track? What are the sorts of the measurements that you... Uh, well, I mean, <clears throat> obviously, there's... there's, there's i tell you what I think is really interesting is tracking, you know, the success in other ways than you might think. Right. Um, so the, the, obviously you have the, the sort of financial tracking, which is all the normal stuff and how much volume you're going to get on the site and how successful it is. But, you know, I think what's really interesting is, is really tracking on, uh, you know, your community engagement and how mm. it's going to affect the, 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 the area that you're building in. You know, what, what impact is our uh, uh, housing development in Essex going to have on the, uh, on the nearby town and how that's all going to work and all the schools and all that kind of stuff. So tracking the success of the project is, is more than just the, the sort of the standard programme. But I'll tell you something else that I find, you know, it's incredibly stressful being an architect because you're actually in the driving seat of some pretty hairy th sort of projects. And what really de-stresses it is making sure that everyone is really understands what's going on and when. And so keeping the timeline really up to date is important. And we report to our clients 
pretty much every month a, a pretty fundamental report that says, you know, this is where we were last month, this is what's our ultimate goal. And we just write, um, you know, out what, what, what's going on to them. That de-stresses the situation completely because everyone really understands the problems that you're facing and how you're dealing with them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we get every consultant, we ask them to write a small report in their own way. And sometimes it's just a few lines saying, I haven't been able to do anything this month because, um, uh, you know, there's a blockage in the critical path. Yes. And then we, we'll have planned for that and we'll have saying, well, um, you know, they'll be getting back onto it, you know, when, when, when that blockage is overcome. Are you ever involved in public procurement or is it mainly sort of private development? Yeah, no, I must say uh, it's nearly all private. Right. Uh, if I'm, uh, 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 and the reason for that is basically because we've just got to know all of the developers in Shoreditch and our yeah. sort of workload has expanded. More and more, um, you know, we're working with um, housing associations and, um, but the, the, because we have an affordable housing component and an affordable workspace component on our larger projects and we need to deliver that. And, but I'll tell you what's really interesting is coming from a private sector uh, sort of uh, architect is that, that we understand all of the importance of placemaking and having diversity in mixed communities and, you know, mixing the old with the young and, you know, building communities around the needs of the people and not their cars necessarily and yeah. all those yeah. sort of issues. And, uh, you know, we, we, we take our affordable housing component to the various housing associations. We're meeting a few at the moment, actually, because we have to ramp it up as the affordable housing components ramped up. Yes. And that's our connection with the um, um, public sector, um, uh, 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 you know, delivery mm. of uh, and, development. And, and with your, the, the, a lot of the clients that you've had, do you find then that they are, do you have any clients that you've been working with literally from the sort of early days of when you were involved mm. in the, you know, regeneration of Shoreditch back in the late 90s, early 2000s? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I've... What's the sort of lifespan of a, of a client? Yeah, 25 years. I mean, some of them, they probably hate me now. No, I, 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 Paul Collins, a local uh, uh, landlord and a property owner around here, is a very nice chap. And he, he you know, he, I, he's known me since I was like 30, you know. Yeah. Like and so, uh, and he, we've evolved together and we've done a load of projects together, you know, and they've been bumpy roads all the way, but yeah. we've both learned, you know, and he's a really good developer, a really good landlord and He's my landlord, so you know, obviously nice Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think that's amazing. That's and you know, we we forget that that's you know how very mm. powerful relationships can you know they can last long mm. periods of time and mm. you know if you're growing your businesses together, yeah, essentially right. that becomes a very, you know, a great you know, the word, yeah. the, the word that's often banded around is mm. synergistic where both of yeah. you are, I think that, yeah, I mean, there's a number of people like that, you know, like we're still in a strong room bar, we're all friends, you know, and it's all very community based. And, you know, but even on our wider projects, we, we work in currently for some offshore investment funds who are desperate to invest in the British property uh, market. And yeah. we, we sit them down and we explain to them how complex it is and all of the things they need to know. But we do it, we use our simplified model to explain that. Otherwise, they'll just freak out and go and invest in somewhere else, you know. But, um, but uh, you know, but some of those now have sort of six years old, and we're working with uh, you know offshore companies, and they're putting their money in the Chinese and uh, you know Turkish and Israeli. Mm. Um, what what, is, what are some of the obstacles that you that you face, like that perhaps you've overcome in the past, mm. and, and the new obstacles that you're facing today? Yeah. I, th I think that the, the, the most important thing that we do uh, as an architecture profession is, is educate the, the the greater population, actually, because it. it, it it's not ignorance, so that's a really rude way to put it, but a lot of people um, have a prejudice against um, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, successful development or uh, mm. uh, good design, basically, and don't understand the benefits of uh, you know, living in the 21st century and, and how we can actually make that really work with the spirit of place, both historically and geographically. Yes. Um, so the, I think the greatest obstacle is overcoming you know, um, uh, you know, uh, a lack of understanding of what it is you're trying to achieve. But it actually, generally within the, the profession, that it, not the construction industry, you know, the property development industry, why you know people tend to get it, as particularly the sort of agents we work with. Um, but it's actually you know uh, making sure that elected members understand where you're coming from when they're voting on your planning application, making sure that you know the people who are going to use it understand that you know that a mixed community is going to be really beneficial to them. Yeah, there are endless models of that. Um, you know, those are the things. But engagement is really important and that's how you overcome it by educating and you have to be really careful how you do that because yeah. you don't want to be cock smart ass you know you, 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 you've got to sort of understand their position and understand why they have views that they do well, um, yeah well, what, what are the sort of practical things that you do to be 
ed- to be an educator, like as, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a manner that's kind of well, listening uh, and, and not, again, dictatorial. But kind absolutely. Of... It's, uh, you, uh, listening is a good word. I mean, it is, you have to really understand where people are coming from, otherwise you're mm. not going to be able to help them. I mean, I think that, you know, it, we're all the same. Yeah, our, when we start, first start studying architecture, we have all these funny ideas about what architecture is. And then over time, you look at all these excellent precedents of what brilliant architecture is, you know. And what, the one thing it isn't is, is, is a, a sort of um, a vanity project. It's not about you. It's yeah. about everyone else. And in order to be able to deliver that, you have to understand the views of the others uh, but you evolve your ideas and you over time uh, 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 and you want other people to understand how that works so that they can sort of buy into the same the same thing which is actually excellence in in procurement you know I mean oh, there's the age-old thing that you know there's there's no point in trying to reinterpret the past in today you know this this whole postmodern thing but, but actually some of it's very successful it's not as simple an answer as that but 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 Contemporary development can be incredibly soft and gentle and really enhance people's lives. And it's all about how we use materials. And we're very lucky to live in 2020 because we understand architecture and how it affects, uh, you know, our, our emotions, actually, yes. of the people who use it in a very different way. And we, you know, it's not all about, you know, creating cold, uh, harsh environments. It's, you know, we want people to have really enhanced lives. Um, so we're using sort of materials and we're using, you know, the way that we order our spaces out so that people have great homes and great communities to live in and great offices to work mm. in that really are unique to the spirit of place that yeah. they're located. Yeah. How, how did you, as a, as a business, establish your values and brand and, brand and your kind of the, the culture of the company? Yeah, because it's, it's very clear, like when you, when you go onto your website and the way that you're talking, that this is something that really kind of shines through everything yeah. that you do and as and is obviously something which is really effective and being yeah. able to build a team is it something that's that has just organically evolved these values it or? is an evolutionary thing i have to be honest um i think i've we, we learned so much at our, in our time in east london working on these very difficult sites and uh, you know uh, and getting to know all the different people but uh, you know up you know you, you get to know experts in um, branding and all sorts of different things and uh, you know uh, that, that about uh, how to form a really good business that is going to deliver your core values mm. now your core values interestingly are uh, they evolve uh, uh, over time uh, the more you become informed i think it goes back to you know when you study architecture and you, you, you learn how to design a great building, that's true. And you go to great universities and you, you, you research. But it's only through sort of implementing those projects through development that you actually really do establish your core value. So, yes. uh, you know, it's like 10 years after you finished your part three in architecture that you start think, you start realizing actually, you know, you're seeing the bigger picture and your, value, your core values become very strong. You know, mm. you, you, you realize you know, well, the first core value, the most important one is it's actually about everyone else. It's not about you. If you really want to do well as an architect, that is one of the core things to understand. And that's when, you know, Douglas and King started yeah. to attract all the right people, you know, not just not just clients, but, uh, you know, people to work with and people to work for. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, yeah, it took a long time to, to evolve. But, it's it, you know, uh, the one thing I really love is that, our identity is is coming out from our buildings recently as well, and it's not just a paper thing that, that people can see that there's a link between the the, the, create, the environments and the buildings we create, and that a lot of successful architects uh, and successful um, uh, people uh, have that same identity over time. But yeah, your core values are expressed in the in the success of your projects. And how do you enrol your your team into, into those as well? Does that kind of come through naturally, or is there? Yeah, uh, I, I you know what. I, Douglas and King, uh, it's interesting. Um, I've, I think the, the, the shortest time any... Uh, people stay with us for years. Yeah. Okay, they don't leave. And I'm, I, I'm really proud of that. And, I, and we've, you know, it's, we've had you know, bust-ups and all sorts of the normal human relationship things. But we've all, you know, we all know what we're there for. We're all right, you know, want to do the very best job we can as an architect. Um, and so, you know, I, I, there's a lot of love in our, in our relationship in our office. And uh, so... You know, uh, when we design a project, they, they are, we, everyone's bought into a bigger picture, mm. a greater goal. And it's not just a sort of task-based um, um, uh, uh, role. I think a lot of architects work like that, to be honest with you. But, um, you know, it's something I'm, re- I'm, I'm really proud of. Yeah. You said one of the, your kind of uh, uh, the main sort of facts for 
success is tenacity. Yeah. And never, never giving up. How do you, how have you developed tenacity? Where does tenacity come from? Yeah. And what does it, what does it, what does it mean for you? Like, it, it's development projects take a long time, and you have to go through all sorts of uh, um, knocks along the way. And it's really important to keep your goals in in, in, in mind, even when you think all is lost. I mean, I, I you know, I. Uh, everyone can build tenacity in their own way. I mean, I come from a farming community uh, down in Somerset, and right. you know, do you know how long it takes to sort of grow a cow? You know, and, and to, to, to get your <laughs> uh, crops to work. You know, yeah. and, you know they're incredibly tena- you know, tenacious people, and they'll be in it for the long run. And I think that that's that's affected mm. me a lot. Um, but yeah, if you, it, you, it, architects are a beautiful thing, and we we can affect people's lives in such a great way, not just our clients, but the people who are going to use the buildings that we're creating. Yeah. And if you want to do that, you've got to be in it from the start to the end. Um, yeah. Great. And what's what have you got planned for 2020? We're doing all sorts. We've got a lot of work. We're working on densification of the suburbs. You know, it, it, this is in line with the, the new London plan. Um, sustainability is a big part. Our whole CPD program is based on sustainability. Mm. Um, and it's to me, it's actually a really much bigger subject than, than uh, you know, um, CO2 emissions and uh, rising sea levels. These are critically important. But, yeah, our CPD program, it's, it's also about, you know, building successful communities, building homes that are going to be successful for the long run, for multiple generations. Um, Building, you know, all sorts of uh, different aspects of sustainable, creating great, um, you know, building in floodplains and how you can work with that. Uh, we work. We've, we've got sustainability consultants, which I've really enjoyed meet, meeting up with very recently, and they've explained all of the new regulations and how we can build with offsite construction mm. and timber frame and reducing, you know, the amount of concrete we use. Concrete terrible, uh, uh, you know, for CO two emissions. Yeah. So yeah, sustainability is this year. That's twenty twenty for us. And, um, and and so how do you uh, kind of do you find that your developers, the clients that you work with, they're, they're very open, they're kind of willing to take risks in terms of design and, and perhaps adopt like a, a sustainability agenda that, you're, yeah. that you've developed or is it something that you, you're actually working together with them? We, we, well, we've got a number of things on our side. A, we've got a very credible business model from the start with, and our yes. client's got he knows he's going to get a profit through what. Uh, so, but, but a lot of the, the things that we're employing, timber frame construction, is being tried and set, tried and tested for centuries. I think it goes back to like obviously you know Shakespeare, strangely, but you know. Um, but more recently, we're, our country's got really good at, uh, at sustainable construction. You know, we've got a lot of policies on our side. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so we need to be able to meet the building regulations and the the, the BRIAM requirements the building research establishment um, assessment for mm. commercial buildings or the zero, the passive house we're working on a really interesting passive house um, sis, uh, project in maidenhead um, of multiple units um, so so there are uh, there are you know the bar is already there you know you've got to overcome that in the same way you've got to come over overcome fire regulations or so yeah. sustainability regulations are very helpful actually to me um, in, in delivering a sustainable right. future yeah. you know um, but but our clients know that we, we've built that into our business model from the very beginning. So it's not something that suddenly takes you by surprise. You know, yeah. you, you've got a very credible plan. But it's also really interesting. You know, there's, there's, it's really nice to create a, a, a healthy environment, mm. you know. But I'll tell you the one thing I think you know, that we did at Douglas and King is we, we worked out what the problem was first. And we looked at places like um, the NASA website, and they've got a great explanation of, of, of why, you know, CO2 is, is, is having an impact on our, uh, in, on our ecosystems. Um, and then you also got people like, uh, you know, shelter the housing, uh, in that they explain you know, the sustainability issue of people sleeping homeless. You know, that, that is a huge issue mm. uh, in sustainability as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, and, and our clients, you know, understand that it puts you in such a strong position when you have that sort of foundation to the way that you're talking about sustainability. Um, and that, that works really well with, you know, planning officers are just saying, look, we need to build these flats. We need yeah. to build how many flats are on that site. And we're going to build it in a timber frame construction. And we're going to, you know, we're going to have um, zero carbon, you know, technologies involved in the heating and cooling systems, you know, that sort of thing. Brilliant. But I have to say that we, there are some very good people that we use, uh, we work with uh, in, our, in our peloton, I like to call it, uh, you know, sustainability consultants. Uh, you know, I've, I, I, we work with, with one of the leading consultants in offsite construction. Um, and, you know, we do, we do, we've got several projects which are... I keep back, I do, I do talk about timber frame a lot, and it's, it's actually because I'm really pleased with what I'm, the results I'm getting off that. And the buildings are all very, you know, in, unique and respond to their individual points on the site. And then, of course, we've got, cons, you know, other consultants in, in sustainability that, that are helping us out in terms of, you know, 
our friends at Flat who are doing the, uh, the heating and cooling and uh, you know showing us how to make our commercial office buildings Briam excellent, which is the highest bar in yeah um, <clears throat> you know uh, uh, how a building will function. The other thing, obviously, is is about reuse, which is something very it's talked about a lot in the architecture press at the moment about uh, reinventing uses for existing buildings, and that's something that that, that we're working a lot with. We, in fact, we've got a project on the Finchley Road, and there's been a huge debate whether we knock down a 30,000 square foot office building and create a 60,000 square foot building you know, in its place. But what we're actually going to be doing is um, strengthening the existing building, recladding it with a very you know, efficient facade, putting two new floors on the back and a whole new block at the back. Um, I actually, you know, I really like that project for and a very old client of mine who would never have dreamt of doing it a few years ago, but um, it's looking great. We've got great engineer. The hard one with that is getting the building to take the loads of the new structures, but uh, you know, and putting in new fire escape cores. But, yeah, um, well, that's that's so interesting. And as you're saying, like being able to talk confidently about the financial business case of the yeah. client that you can start proposing ideas that they mm. may never have kind of been yeah. considering. Like you know, they might have bought this site looking at this site <coughs> totally with the idea of clearing it and building something new and actually yeah. you're able to put together a long-term business case yeah. that well to, in all, that was a very difficult question to answer actually and we did a lot of testing with contractors and with quantity surveyors mm. to work out you know and we did a load of sketch diagrams that showed the you know what what the building will deliver for our client in terms of you know his own lettable space and you know what will the values will be but we worked with the contractor to the, the funny thing is what we if I'm completely honest, only really us and the sustainability consultants were the people who were really championing the, the fact that the building should be retained as much as possible. Um, because it didn't make much sense to us to knock down something that looked perfectly good. So mid 20th century, mid 20th century structure, it's probably stronger than it, way stronger than it should be. Um, but, we, but everyone else, you know, the, the ultimate goal was to create this building that had offices and flats in it. You know, that was, but we had to make sure that one of the core aspirations, one of the core values of this development was the sustainable approach to it. And that's why we've, we've, we've managed to get, to get it through. It's, it's going into planning next week, actually. That Martin, absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you. you very much. Thank you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit Smart Practice Method. Dot com, or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.